Well, thank you very much, Margaret, and uh, it's really a great honour to be able to um, uh, speak uh, at your uh, own very prestigious institute here in uh, Dublin. Uh, I have never visited Ireland in my life until yesterday when I arrived, and uh, that's a bit shameful because even though I'm called Alistair Murray MacLean, which suggests that I have only Scottish heritage, uh, my mother's family was Irish, so uh, uh, I still have a fondness for uh, for both parts of uh, the, these islands. Um, and uh, uh, I uh, really um, have uh, only very recently taken on this role as a non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute, which in its 11 years of history has indeed established uh, a very good reputation for its uh, concentration on international issues, particularly on Asia. But when I was a member of the Australian Foreign Service um, for 42 years from 1970 through to uh, 2012, when I retired from active salaried uh, employment with the government, um, I somewhat unusually I think would be the way to put it concentrated or found my career concentrated in its entirety actually on Asia and that was um, even the three and a half years I had in Washington DC where we have a huge embassy my beat was Asia Pacific and uh, great power relations at the time in the mid 80s. So, apart from that one excursion outside uh, Asia, all my postings have been in Asia, with three in China where I spent 15 years. I speak Mandarin Chinese, but I ended up as ambassador for seven years in Japan as well as uh, the other plants you mentioned. So, I feel very comfortable about talking about Asia. It's uh, in the 1970, um, yes, Australia was already well and truly oriented to Asia, but uh, we have undergone a huge evolution in our own approach to uh, the broader Asia, and uh, uh, that's actually what I will um, speak uh, about in the context of my of concentrating, I suppose, particularly on the current um, uh, growth and. Uh, uh, expanding influence of, of, of China in the region. Um, for Australia, uh, perhaps I can state it's a statement of the obvious, but the reason that uh, we are, that, that I, I was so privileged to be able to spend so much time working on Asia consistently is that um, for Australia, increasingly more than ever before, it's our major focus in foreign policy and um, we our top three trading partners by miles are China which is about 25% of our total trade Japan which had hitherto been as much as 25 and is now about 15 to 18% of our total trade and South Korea are our three major trading partners, not the United States. The United States is by far the biggest investor in Australia, followed by the UK, but then um, uh, Japan is the next biggest investor. Again, four or five times more investment in Australia than from China, even though if you read the newspapers in Australia, the only reports are about all of China's growth, buying out of Australia's uh, resources and all the rest. Well, it's actually not the case. The, there is a lot of new investment from China in Australia, but it is actually matched by new investment from Japan, the same level. Um, so we, as a country in Australia, we have interests throughout Asia and that's I suppose the first point I wanted to make before getting into the real subject matter of my discussion today is that while I'm talking about <coughs> focusing my remarks later on about China, Australia as a country with a future set by uh, our geography in part um, 
must concentrate on Asia. Um, it is not about a relationship with one country, namely China. It's about having a multifaceted set of relationships with those countries where it is terribly important for us to give uh, full value to our, uh, our, those relationships, to broaden our to, to give full satisfaction to our interests with these countries. Um, we have probably uh, the broadest, more comprehensive relationship amongst Asian countries with Japan of any other country because with Japan we are both, we share one particular thing in common and that is, well a number of things in common and that is that Australia um, and Japan are both allies of the United States and we are also uh, of course flourishing democracies with a lot of shared values such as exercise of rule of law and uh, a strong interest in preservation of world, regional and world peace. So there are a lot of symmetries which have led towards, led, led us towards over the last uh, five or six years to an, uh, an increased uh, scope of um, security cooperation, uh, which has uh, was further advanced during talks between our foreign and defence ministers respectively in 2 plus 2 talks only last week. Um, I'm not going to go through each of the relationships but it's terribly important that Australia get right its relationships not only with Japan but with China, with Indonesia which of course is the nearest large country of Asia to us, the fourth largest by population in the world the largest uh, is Islamic country in the world and uh, of huge importance in Southeast Asia generally and it will take off uh, and is beginning to take off over time. So it's terribly important that that is uh, managed very well. And then of course there's India, um, which uh, so much so that now policymakers in Australia are talking about not so much necessarily Asia Pacific but as the Indo Pacific to ensure that India is included in the same level of priorities as Japan, um, China, in Indonesia, and all of the other uh, smaller but nonetheless important countries. So that's why we have such a great deal of interest in, in Asia. And that's really the background from where I'll address the remain uh, the, my, my primary remarks. As Margaret said in the introduction, we were discussing over lunch some of the aspects of the current situation and uh, which prevails currently in, in East Asia. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that in the years, in the 40 years since the end of the Vietnam War and the Indo-Chinese Wars involving Cambodia and whatnot, let's say from 1980 onwards, that the current situation in East Asia is more uncertain than ever before. And that is because, as Margaret said, there is now a constant uh, string of incidents and disputes that are bubbling up involving disputes over sovereignty, territorial sea and involving multiple countries. And that includes, obviously, the claims that China has to a vast part of the South China Sea, which overlaps claims of several of the states, uh, literal states of, of that Ch South China Sea, such as Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines in particular. And then there's also the somewhat complicated issue of the fact that 
Taiwan is also a factor there that may not always necessarily share precisely the same claims as China, although in many senses it does. Um, so all of those are factors there that are there. And then on top of that, you have, of course, the tensions, if that's not too strong a term, I think it's correct to say that, between China and Japan. That relates primarily, or is focused primarily, on the island chain, which the Japanese call Senkakus and the Chinese call the Diaoyu Tai group. The Japanese position on that is that there is no dispute that it is Japanese sovereignty, under Japanese sovereignty. The Chinese say at the very least there is dispute because it is Chinese sovereignty that is exercised over them. Um, and so we've had a very worrying spiralling up of uh, tension involving incidents uh, involving naval boats, coast guard boats and military aircraft or, uh, around those islands so much so that there was one last week involving planes allegedly 30 metres apart only. Um, that comes on top of the visceral uh, dislike which uh, the Chinese have of Japan and I'd have to say is reciprocated by the Japanese. I'm speaking as a non-official now, of course I can say that. Um, and it isn't helped by actions sometimes taken for domestic political purposes by each of the two countries concerned. So we have a situation where we've got the two by far biggest economies in the East China area uh, the second, the world's second and third largest economies who trade and invest in each other uh, very significant, very heavily as well um, basically shaping up but maybe it's because I've had 42 years of being a diplomat, I am convinced that neither Japan nor China wants it to go beyond the state of shaping up. It is totally against the interests of either side to end up with even a limited state of conflict between the two of them. And of course... This is where Australia again comes into it and in fact all countries of the world come into it really that trade with these two huge economies. It is certainly not in the interests of either, either uh, of, 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 of the rest of the world that it, it, it were to deteriorate into such a state. And while it's not a logical conclusion immediately to say therefore it won't, I'm pretty confident it won't unless there are some further developments that I can't predict. And if we were to turn then to the other disputes that China has with Southeast Asia, Asian countries, particularly Vietnam and the Philippines, but also Malaysia, um, I think there's a somewhat different story. It's about the fact that uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, for reasons that aren't entirely clear that China has decided to take on really quite um, intrusive actions um, such as setting up an oil rig near the Paracel Islands, or as they would call them, the 
um, I've forgotten which was what the Chinese call them now, but anyway, it's the, Sprac- the, the, the Paracel Islands uh, are the generally accepted term in uh, English parlance. Um, and that's where we've had 136 Chinese boats protecting this rig. Some of probably none of them marked as such as naval boats, I think, but probably with naval connections. And you've had 70 or so Vietnamese boats. Um, and you've had clashes. And you've had reactions in Vietnam where Chinese interests such as factories and uh, individuals being trashed or attacked or demonstrated against. Pretty serious stuff. Um, One of the periods I spent when I had a a period in Canberra in 1978-79 was writing analysis of the so-called Chinese counter-attack in self-defence against Vietnam, which took place when China decided to punish Vietnam for uh, border provocations alleged in their border. Um, And what we're seeing at the moment, I think, is probably the most serious sort of development between those two countries since then. And this all comes at a time when Vietnam is obviously uh, doing extremely well as an economy. It's so terribly much smaller than China, but it's a very vibrant economy. It's got a significant amount of investment um, from outside Japan, Taiwan, and also, of course, China. Uh, so this is very disruptive, as it were. Then you've got the Philippines. The Philippines has been through difficult times over the last decades, uh, but there's nothing like something like this to bring the nation together. Um, and... Uh, uh, very interestingly, while the disputes haven't been quite of the nature of severity as the ones with Vietnam, that uh, you have you have uh, a very a standoff between the two, and the diplomatic relationship is 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 not very uh, comfortable at the moment. What's very interesting is that the Philippines have decided to seek arbitration over the disputed islands that they have with China and uh, it's too early to know whether they're even going to arbitration but I think uh, some commentators have mentioned that the case that the Philippines have is by no means one that can be easily dismissed. Um, All of this points to a rather tense and disrupted zone or at least uh, area and one may well ask the question why is this the case since China has said since they began their reforms in 1978 under Deng Xiaoping that they need for the next century or whatever I don't think I've mentioned the time frame but certainly for a long time a peaceful and stable environment because that is the best assurance of their being able to concentrate on economic growth and development. Um, why then are these, has this pressure been ratcheted up in such a way? Why are there, is there so much uncertainty and tension? Good question. Is it about China simply reasserting itself now that it is very confident of its position as a major world economy, uh, the second world economy, perhaps very soon in some statistical ways the biggest economy? Um, Is it about still trying to right what it sees as the wrongs of the 19th and the first half of the 20th century when China was heavily affected by colonial experiences from the European powers and uh, the first 10 years of the Chinese communist rule where they were subject subject to uh, Soviet dominance. It could be all of that. It could also be about the fact that 
1945 they were one of the victors of the war in the Pacific, but somehow or other in their terms they turned out to be a loser, whereas Japan, which was the loser of the Pacific War through the American occupation and huge American support, quickly became a victor after the war. These are all questions. Um, but whatever we are faced with at the moment is a situation that has conflicting interests amongst the major powers in the region. We have the United States that in some people's eyes is somewhat ambivalent about its long-term future in the region, although I think if you scratch the Americans they would say for sure we are committed and we've indeed cast a, a new pivot of activity in Asia to bolster the peace and security of the region. And that is true to a certain extent. Um, but we have in, we've always had in North Asia the interaction of major powers. If you look back in the immediate post-war decades, you had the Soviet Union, China, Japan and the United States all, all mixing it, as it were, their interests all intersecting in that region. We're seeing that in ever more than before with rather a stronger China, of course, than before a somewhat weaker Russia, but a still very strong um, United States and a still pretty strong Japan, plus the interests of South Korea and Southeast Asia and indeed Australia are all there as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's why I opened my remarks by saying it's a very uncertain time and it might make it, it might be rather more difficult in the future. It's not going to go away any time soon. So that's my opening remarks. Thank you.